All right, welcome to this afternoon's uh, pre-meeting. We will first order business to find out if any board member would like to discuss any of the agenda items for the regular meeting at 6.30. Here and now we'll go into our first briefing. Marta QA, Mr. Greenwood. All right, good evening, Chairman Turner, commissioners, and thanks for your time this afternoon. I also want to acknowledge our, our MARTA board members, Kathleen Powers and Valencia Williams, uh, observing remotely. I'm just going to get into the agenda right off the bat. Uh, just a, a minute or two on the budget summary, a couple minutes on operations updates, and similarly on the 2040 capital expansion. With your indulgence, I just wanted to tell you that, um, of course, we know that the documents were shared with the commissioners and staff on or, on or around May 18th, so you've got the actual budget documents, but there are a few budget hearing highlights that I wanted to share with you, um, not the least of which is the fact that um, this is what MARTA's building its successes on. So we've, we're doing well in this area. We've, we've got more workforce, more customers, more technology, more money, and more financial credibility in the space. Conversely, we have less. We have less crime, less operator assaults, less safety risks, less food deserts in our midst. So these strategic thrusts will continue as our perennial priorities at MARTA, um, but this can be seen in our specific moves for FY24, and not the least of which is our service levels. So you can see here our FY24 service levels make it clear that we'll be scheduling the same level of service that we had pre-pandemic. Uh, it wasn't an easy task, but as you know, we've kept you, kept you updated throughout the year in terms of our, our recruitment efforts, and I'm happy to say that there is such now that we'll be able to schedule that level of service. And it's important because you lead with service, and that's how you lead ridership and try to grow your ridership, which of course, as we know, is a significant part of our fund. Um, in terms of the sources and uses for, for the 10-year outlook, salient point here is that we're showing delivery of all planned capital projects in Clayton County by 2030. The other point is that all the, the sources and uses will fund the full list of Clayton County expansion projects. And uh, as a reminder, that asterisk tells you that the total project cost estimate of the Clayton Operations and Maintenance Facility, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $250 million, will be shared between the Mormarta Clayton County and the, more, and the MARTA State of Good Repair Corps Penny. Uh, top projects for FY24, five of them, and largely they come up to about 92% of the overall budget. The other 8% is made up of uh, communications contract for half a million and $2 million in contingency funding. In terms of our operations updates, the, the um, Oh, good. <laughs> the first chart is a familiar one, just a, a point that we've said all along, it'll be a slow and steady return towards regular service, and that's what we're seeing here. So year over year, uh, that continues. If you go February to February, you'll see the bus had a 67, is 67 percent of its pre-COVID numbers. Rail, 56 percent. Uh, uh, streetcar is at 68 percent, and um, mobility is at 85 percent. So that's February to February, but of course, since February, you can see that our metrics have continued to increase. Uh, the workforce and service update I alluded to earlier, uh, you know, hiring remains a priority, but hiring was up considerably over the past, over the past year. And uh, we participated in three hiring events in Clayton County. Two of them were the WorkSource Clayton events, and one of them was, um, was Director Commissioner Anderson's uh, D1 Career Fair where we made uh, lots of connections, and, and I think that was on April 29th. So that, th those, those kinds of efforts continue, and uh, we find that that's very helpful in building our workforce now and in the future. In terms of our capital expansion, I wanted to start with our bus shelters amenities update. As you know, it's a five-year program, 1,000 amenities in total. Um, for FY23, we are charged with bringing Clayton County 30 more amenities and 12 of them have already been installed. That brings us to about 100 amenities installed countywide. The balance are still, six of them are under construction, nine in permitting, and three in design. And of course, when that's finished, FY24, we'll see another 30 uh, installments. And this is just what it looks like. Again, before and after pictures, but, but basically, you know, the issue here is that uh, 
if you're standing um, at that location at Terra Boulevard and Flint River before March 16th, uh, you would have been subject to the heat of the sun or, or the rain overhead or the puddles underfoot. Um, and after the 16th of March, you're, you're, you're not standing in any of that. In fact, you're sitting, if you want to be, there's a garbage receptacle as well and information posted on the boards. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is the, uh, we got the concrete pad there and you see a sidewalk going towards it, but based on our efforts with safe streets to transit, we'll be expanding the number of locations that have sidewalks, not only at the station or at the stop, but you know, on, on route to the stop. So that is a, a successful program that continues on to this day. Uh, the Justice Center Transit Hub, um, as of yesterday, we've entered final design of the Justice Center Transit Hub. We've onboarded uh, the final design phase consultant, and final design is expected to be completed in Q3 of 2024. Yeah, I'll go over the features again for, for those that don't recall, but it's, you know, first of all, it's going to be a, a real improvement on the quick build facilities <laughs> that we have in place now. We'll, better, it, we'll be better able to serve major bus uh, services and bus bus transfer points in Clayton. We'll have eight bus bays. We'll have a bay for articulated buses. Uh, it'll serve future BRT. We'll have restrooms, vending services, a police precinct, a canopy, a customer service kiosk, and, of course, lighting. We also have the multi-purpose O&M uh, maintenance facility. So in terms of an update there, we're on track to deliver this facility by 2026. Uh, an updated site plan is shown here. And, and the, the good news is that MARTA has, now has full possession of both parcels. The last remaining tenant is scheduled to vacate in August. So uh, this facility, we've always said, will bring about jobs, about 400 jobs. And so now it's time for us to turn our attention to that specifically. So Martyr started an internal task force um, looking at designing a training program with the technical college, colleges and ensuring job opportunities reach the Clayton County residents. In terms of the South Lake uh, BRT update, we've got um, Federal grant small starch rating was requested and anticipated for August 2023. You'll remember that this is the first FTA capital investment grant program entry since the 1990s. So we're very proud to move that forward. Uh, in August, we will be re uh, submitting the rating request. And uh, we'd like to thank you, the commission, and uh, those the, the staff working with you for supporting our economic development scoring by adopting transit supportive updates in the comprehensive development plan and zoning ordinance. So that was really helpful in terms of getting this project to be competitive in terms of density, setbacks, block size, street design, those kinds of land use and economic development um, components that make a project um, more competitive when, when grants are being handed out. We also have the SR 54, State Route 54 bus rapid <coughs> transit update. Um, you'll recall that in November of last year, the MARTA board, based on your assistance and your, your support, um, they formally adopted bus rapid transit as the preferred mode for this project. So the map here generally represents the project's route serving Hapeville, Forest Park, Lake City, Jonesboro, and Lovejoy, and it reflects the updated mode from commuter rail to BRT. You'll also note that the requested connections through Mountain View, uh, downtown Jonesboro, and the Justice Center hub are made possible here by this modal shift. Um, this project team has continued evaluating route alternatives to optimize ridership, and uh, we'll be bringing the results to the, before the Committee of Stakeholders for input on June 26th in person and June 27th virtually. Of course, the zoning updates mentioned for South Lake BRT will also, also apply here. And Gooder. Just wanna. Our uh, Marta Fresh Market partnership with Gooder launched its first three mobile markets uh, to bring fresh food to those in need. All events were fully staffed. We had over 300 participants, and we were able to even serve additional walk-up participants. So that felt good for us, and the participants received us with open arms. At the two events at the Senior Center, we also opened up a reduced fare pop-up uh, opportunity. So we had pop-up registration tables for reduced fares for seniors and riders with disabilities to easily access reduced fare cards instead of having to go to headquarters or five points to get that done. So uh, we really want to thank Clayton County Public Schools and Senior Center staff for their support of these events. And we've been in touch with each commissioner to make sure uh, we can identify the most impactful locations and spread the word about the future four events that are still, still to come. 
I thought I, yep, we are. So I just want to close with upcoming events, just a, a recap of what's going on. Uh, we, the, the board vote is on Thursday for the budget. Uh, developer roundtable on June 15th has, has been postponed. We'll come up with a new date shortly um, after this. We have a citizens advisory board meeting on the 21st, public meetings in person on the 26th, and virtually on the 27th. And then of course, as I said earlier, we'll have four more Gooder Mobile Grocery giveaway events based on the input that we received from the team here. So with that, Chairman Turner, I'll re return the floor to you. Thank you, Mr. Grant, for your presentation. Are there any questions uh, from board members? I have one, Chairman Turner. Commissioner Anderson. Um, the pod cars, um, they're, they're like the little simulated cars that people can walk out to if they, they want an Uber or if they're in a meeting. Um, are you all walk, working towards using those um, at your stations? Um, the personal rapid transit, yeah, the yeah, automated PRT, pods? Is it PRT? PRT. <laughs> yeah, PRT. So we are, we are working with uh, airport CID okay. um, and, and yeah. sort of forwarding the paperwork to go out for tender and, and figure out what that's going to look like. We've gone to a couple of different locations to see um, how, that, how that works okay. and, and plan to continue with that. So we are working with them, but we're, we're supporting their efforts. When will you be able to um, bring a presentation for the board to see? Um, or when will you all just? We'll, I think we'll have more to say okay. in the next six to eight months. So you'll make a decision then. Okay. And, and we will definitely create support for or arguments against. Okay. But, um, right. We'll bring it to you then. Thank you. You're welcome. One second, Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead. Commissioner Amber. Yeah, I don't have a question, but I would like to um, request that we add Clayton State University to that list of. Uh, you mentioned technical schools and all for the maintenance facility. Yes. If you would add Clayton State University. Absolutely. Commissioner Frank. Hello. I'm sorry. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, I want to piggyback on that. I think that this board needs to be aware, although I no longer serve on the ATL, there were some missing information with those, with the personal rapid transit over at the airport. Um, quite a bit of holes need to be filled. It is on the project list, but it has a lot of requirements that need to be met prior to. And I believe, unfortunately, there was some assumption that was circulated among the board prior to me leaving that all those jurisdictions were in support of it, mm. when we actually know our prioritization very well here in the district. And number one, obviously, because we've been here and it's coming, 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 is um, the project that is in Commissioner Hambrick's district. That's priority. Number one, that's overdue. It's, uh, it's just way overdue. I'm like, Understood. every, every presentation is, we're working, we're working, we're working. I think your previous CEO has been gone, unfortunately, from this world for a while now, and we're still working and working. The citizens deserve better. It needs to get done, not we're working on it. We're in this phase. We need to be beyond that. Um, also, if we're gonna have to take on the, um, the BRT, which I do support uh, because of the fact that it will allow us to be able to um, be able to get activated for at least one of those buckets of funding. Once it's operational, then we can look at expanding it even further. Um, but we've got to focus on what needs to be done first and foremost. And unfortunately, I could tell you um, the board voted, and you can go back to that meeting, we definitely uh, feel there are some holes with that personal rapid transit at the airport. That's not something that we're, we, this board, we, it's not come before this board to vote, to vote on or to invest in. Right. And the other thing is, how are you gonna present something when you don't even invest in it yourself? Atlanta, city of Atlanta and the airport had no stake in the game. None. Yeah. So I, again, on the PRT, that's not a MARTA-led initiative. Right. We've been approached, and so we're supportive in terms of let's see what this is about, kick the tires, and and as we develop a, an opinion ourselves, we will be forefront and sharing. Just don't it with spend you. our money as you kick them I tires. Okay? Understood. <laughs> that's Understood. what I'm trying to tell you. Understood. So this board evaluates it. Do not spend a dime of our money until. Fair enough. Any other Stop. questions? Uh, yes, Chairman. Commissioner Davis, uh, as far as the multi-purpose and operational ma uh, the operations maintenance facility, yes. Uh, how is transit oriented development being being looked at and yeah. just studied with that project? Yeah. So our our TOD office has that in hand in terms of what can we bring in terms of mixed use development, uh, affordable housing, and uh, 
adding density to the space and not just at that location but along the corridors that, that are serving or, or passing by it so I don't have a definitive answer for you now but the, the, the fact is you're absolutely right we're not going to let that opportunity pass without leveraging what we have in terms of land space and proximity to bring TOD to life there as well as also with the advent of you know, this whole hydrogen boom going on uh, within the state of Georgia Hopefully that's going to be looked at as well and studied as well as well as for this project. Yeah, Mart Marta has joined the, the Hydrogen Roundtable sponsored by Senator Ossoff and, and a, a vast number of peers in the space, whether it's transportation, uh, construction, or fuel, um, or even public service, to sit around and basically figure out, you know, how we can generate, how we can use, what are the use cases, and is this something that we can go forward with? Again, you know, we, we haven't made a firm decision, but it is something that we're investigating. Great. Thank you. Pleasure. Any other questions? Again, sir, thank you for the presentation. And thank you. We'll be looking for uh, the next quarterly. Thanks, everyone. Personnel action, Mr. Brooks. Good evening, board. Uh, I am coming before the boards um, to offer information on three personnel actions that I intend on um, offering to the board for a vote. Um, but I want to offer additional information prior to that. Um, and so um, I'll take it in order. It's uh, three matters that I think are fairly emergency and then Mass, I'd like the board to address with uh, expedience. The first uh, is um, pay disparities between um, the law enforcement community. And so in the district attorney's office and the solicitor general's office, um, both of those offices have investigators, okay? Um, the county has three, I believe it's three different pay scales for law enforcement. There's sworn, there's public safety, uh, unsworn, and then there's first responder. Um, it's come to my attention that some personnel who are identified as investigators in both offices uh, are classified as first responder of uh, public safety. Uh, and that pay scale is the highest of pay scales, and others are classified as uh, just sworn public safety. Um, that differential, um, is, is not in line with what parity would suggest it needs to be. Um, the most recent uh, law enforcement death, or I shouldn't say the most recent, but uh, one of the, Deputy Rick Daly, uh, who lost his life serving warrants for the Clayton County Sheriff's Office, he was serving warrants. That's similar to the type of work that our investigators do. Um, in, every day, our investigators are required to serve subpoenas on witnesses. Uh, they go out uh, in law enforcement um, markings, mark, uh, unmarked vehicles. They wear vests. They have arrest powers. They have uh, the peace officer law enforcement uh, credentials. Uh, but they're not classified as first responders. At least some of them are not classified as first responders. And so what I'm asking the board is to consider um, uh, putting all investigators in parity with first responders because some of them are already classified as first responders and others are not. Um, most recently in my office, we just lost an investigator to another county because of this pay differential. Um, nothing, nothing wrong with the office, nothing wrong with the work, it's just the pay differential. And so um, if there's additional information or uh, specific information that the board would like, I'll, I'll be more than glad to talk about it. I'm not sure if it's the appropriate to talk in a public forum given we're talking about specific personnel, um, but uh, I wanted to put that uh, information before the board and ask the board to vote on that. Uh, any questions regarding that matter? I have a question. Yes. When you said that you lost one, that they go to a different jurisdiction or that they move within our county among? No, they went to a different jurisdiction altogether. They went to Cobb County uh, Sheriff's Office. Got it. Uh, the pay uh, differential is significant. The uh, benefits can, are different too. Yes, yeah, about twenty, about a $20,000 pay differential, mm -hmm. um, but the same type of work. Um, any additional questions? 
back up just a little bit for me. I'm yes, sorry. With this investigator, you're saying some are first responders and some are. So, uh, according, uh, I, I recently learned that some of some investigators are classified as first responders, public safety. Okay. Others are classified as just public safety. How, how is this classification determined? I think it's through HR. Okay. Um, and so, mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that where the difference came. Um, but it's the same work for all investigators. Okay, and that was going to be my next mm -hmm. question. So it is the same work it's across the, same the board. Work. So can you tell us if you know where those investigators are assigned to? One of them is in my office. Um, and I, 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 far Had as a different. Had he been somewhere else? I'm sorry to interrupt. Second. Had he been somewhere else prior to coming back to the office? Yes. Where? Yes. And not not job-wise, not uh, In the district attorney's agency. office. So one, I have an investigator that was previously in the district attorney's office in my office, uh, that investigator is classified as uh, first responder per public safety, but I also have another investigator who's classified as just public safety. And then, but, what, but again, now obviously their their um, pay grades are different because of the because of the, the levels of uh, authority. Um, but far as like the classification, far as like pay tables, they should be on the same pay table. Clear. How many of these? investigators are we talking about? I can't answer that. Uh, I can only answer for my office. There's at least two in my office. Uh, but among all the investigators of both offices, I can't, I can't speak okay. to that. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Frank. Yes, this is concerning because I know back in 2018, I was encouraged actually by Mr. Chair back then that we need to move on with this um, parity study. But at the time, I saw several discrepancies in that study. So what you're telling us today is even though the county has spent money on a pay parity study, this was still overlooked and is still not being addressed. Along with one thing that I've been stating is dealing with the um, ability to receive additional pay for education. This board is yet to deal with that. So um, there are, those, both now that you brought this matter before us, then um, that is a great concern because all these people are in the same risk category. And unless there's some additional training that others have gone through, then that it is definitely problematic. And I would hope that staff would figure it out and get it right and get it done somehow, and, some and, way. And Commissioner, just to offer uh, additional clarity, there, there are three salary tables that I understand they're classified in. First responder public safety, non-public safety, and public safety. And so, um, some, like I say, some investigators are classified first responder public safety, and others are classified just public safety. But in any event, they all have law enforcement, the appropriate law enforcement credentials to ex to execute police power, execute police powers. Are the um, CEOs public safety as well, or are they non sworn? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We need to figure. Out. Um, I, I don't know if they have arrest powers, uh, the same the that uh, that. Uh, that my investigators would, but to, uh, to further elaborate on the arrest powers of my investigators, each one of our investigators are deputized by the Sheriff's Department. And so they have arrest powers not just in Clayton, but anywhere that, need, that arrest can occur in the state of Georgia. Got it. Any additional questions to that particular item? All right. Um, item two uh, is in regarding a reclassification. Um, back in 2021, I began a dialogue with this board <clears throat> regarding, um, again, regarding pay. Uh, I am not here to request additional positions, but I am here to request reclassification on pay. Um, to give you background information, according to the American Bar Association, the average law school graduate owes about $165,000 in educational debt upon graduation. $165,000 in educational debt upon graduation. About 95% of students take out loans. About 55% of students postpone buying a house. 30% postpone getting married. Of the ones that enter into public service, about 63% only enter public service because of loan forgiveness eligibility. Uh, now, loan forgiveness eligibility is what keeps public service afloat, but it doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, right now, the, sal the starting salaries for prosecutors is below where a person can go to Quick Trip and become a manager and make more. That's a fact. 
That's a fact. Um, and so what I'm asking this board to consider is for um, prosecutors, solicitors, assistant solicitors, to raise the, the floor of where the entry level uh, salaries are. Um, specifically, if you want dollar amounts, I can give you dollar amounts or I can give you grades and steps. Um, but preference wise, for solicitor generals, assistant solicitor generals, I'm asking to raise the floor from 277, that's grade and step, to 2717. Uh, for senior assistant one, that's 293 to 2917. For a senior assistant solicitor general, that's 31.3 to 31.15. For a deputy chief assistant, that's 31.1 to 32.15. For a chief assistant solicitor, that would be from 34.3 to 34.12. Um, why do I ask this? Um, because right now, and for the last several months and years, years in fact, um, my office has been running 100% capacity workload on 50% staff, and that leads to burnout. I can't speak to the entire county, but I can only speak to my office. 100% of the workload on 50% of the staff. We slide it for about 10, 10 prosecutors, for trial attorney prosecutors. We have about five. We haven't even got traffic for applications because of where the salaries, salary grades are. Uh, just recently, I had, a, I had an exchange with uh, Human Resources just about posting salary ranges uh, just to get traffic up. Um, and that was a whole, uh, whole day uh, to have the conversation about posting salary ranges. Uh, if this county is serious about public safety, and I believe this county is, um, based on how I've seen votes, and I come to every Board of Commissioners meeting, if you didn't know, based on how I've seen votes as it relates to the law enforcement community, as it relates to courts, I would ask that you uh, be, public, be serious about public safety all the way around, um, because we can have a courthouse full of deputies and no prosecutors, and we won't have public safety. And that's what it really boils down to. If we got, if we got two, or three pros, two or three deputies in the courtroom and no prosecutors, court won't happen. So let me ask, let's go back to the steps and grades that you were mm -hmm. throwing out. What's the actual annual salary? The, the current, current for AS, uh, entry level ASG is $66,000, seven, $76,041. That's not even half of what the law school debt would be. And you're asking to, to raise it to seventy-four thousand eight hundred and sixteen dollars and thirty-seven cents. That's for ahead. ASG for a senior ASG one. That's sixty-nine thousand four hundred forty-two dollars sixty-eight cents. Raise that to eighty-two thousand six hundred thirty-three dollars and sixty-six cents. Senior ASG two is seventy-six thousand six hundred ninety-eight dollars forty-seven cents. Raise that to eighty-nine thousand zero. $89,028.11. What's the difference in the qualifications of one, two, and three? Uh, ASG is a person who is in, in experience straight out, of, uh, straight out of law school. Okay. A person who is a one and a two. A one is a mid-level mid uh, prosecutor, mid-level experience. A, a senior two would be somebody who is more senior, uh, seasoned, probably okay. three, or three between three to five years of experience. Okay. Um, a deputy chief is a person who will be considered in executive uh, management, and a chief assistant will be uh, uh, the highest appointed position uh, if something were to occur, something to happen to me. They would uh, be the acting solicitor general. And what's the total financial impact? Uh, that information hasn't been provided by uh, HR yet. Okay. You said you were on the phone for an hour with HR? All day. I was on the phone all day. All day? Yes, ma'am. That, uh, that was from... I can't remember what day that was. How many positions were you trying to post? Um, all of the assistant solicitor general positions. Which is how many? Uh, that's three, it's three positions. Three? It's three positions, but the salary ranges was what we we're trying to post. And it wasn't a question of whether or not we're trying to hire people at, at a specific pay grade. We just wanted the, the range to be posted to get activity of applications. Um, 
we couldn't do that <laughs> because the way uh, the way that it was understood is that civil service brings folks in at a certain pay grade, which is the the lowest the lowest possible grade on the grading step uh, chart. Uh, however, something unique to the Solicitor General's office, my prosecutors are not civil service protected, and so the civil service rules don't necessarily apply in the same way they might apply to others. Um, by statute, I'm, I'm to set the salaries with the approval of the board. And so I'm asking for your approval to set these salaries at this rate. Chairman. Commissioner Davis. Yeah, I see this as, as a dynamic problem that, is, mm -hmm. that has existed for some time and is going to continue. My question is, with modifying these salaries as you want to, what's the effect of draft on this? Above that, what's what's going to happen? Because if we're doing it at the bottom, how mm -hmm. is it going to affect those that are already there? Mm -hmm. How are we beginning to handle that? Uh, pot potentially, uh, you have I, I think they call it compression issues. Mm -hmm. um, potentially, um, but right now I'm operating at 50 percent capacity, and so uh, the compression issues. I'm I'm less concerned about the compression issues because the prosecutors that I have there now, uh, they've been there to the point where they are not at entry level. Um, I've, I've come before this board on several occasions to try to raise them um, incrementally based on their experience. Because okay. I think if we begin to look at modifying those salaries at the bottom, we've got to take into consideration the modification of, of the existing salaries as well within your department. Absolutely. Absolutely. But let me make sure I'm not missing something, and I'll wait to be acknowledged. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, glad you asked that question, but so maybe I'm assessing it differently but i thought you said you were looking at affecting each level and yes. not just raising the that's right bottom salary that's right it's so then why would that cause well a salary. compression issue if you are addressing all levels within your office for I'm existing prosecutors Un unless I, unless i release prosecutors or terminate them and rehire them that, that would be the issue so then we would have to basically do a uh, adjustment for those that are in those positions yes ma'am well, if we're going to look at it, I think that, it, I mean, to um, uh, Commissioner Davis's point, I think we have to look at it that way because I think that's what happened in 2018. And that's what's going to happen, when, what's coming before us now, even with our pension fund, because we're setting policy as a board, but we're not setting that policy to understand the long term effect um, in, in all capacities, whether it's comp uh, compression or even the effect on a pension fund, which we're now having to go fix in the uh, regular business meeting. So uh, I would love to be able to kind of do a deeper dive. Commissioner, let me that. let me offer this as well. Uh, yes. And I, I don't mean to interrupt, but- No, go ahead. Um, the, my current staff of prosecutors are primarily entry level prosecutors. And so um, because I've uh, uh, attend, uh, presented to this board on other occasions to try to raise them up, the compression would be minimal. Oh, okay. And so, uh, it, it'd be minimum. And I see what you're saying. At at, at best, maybe two thousand, maybe. And, uh, so you, and to your point, <clears throat> you've also came before us to ask for pay adjustments on some of the new people who you hired. So that's they came in saying. at a higher rate too. That's right. That's right. And and that lead that's a perfect segue to my third personnel okay. um, request. Uh, are there any additional questions for that particular item? For item two. Just so we're all clear. Uh, once again, you want to affect all three roles. That's number one, positions, mid-level, beginning, deputy. Number two, you're saying most of the people you brought in, you've already come before the board to make said adjustments, which would um, be able to uh, help you address the compression issue. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, my third, a third item is um, negotiating authority. And that, that's why I say it's a perfect segue. Um, as uh, the chairman uh, pointed out, I've come before this board on individual individual um, uh, persons uh, based on based on their experience to request of the board to allow me to bring them in at a different rate than HR suggests uh, is the entry level rate. Um, and this board has been gracious enough to uh, to grant those requests in the times that I've come. Um, but right now, I'm asking uh, this board to just give me a uh, negotiating authority uh, where I can uh, where I can negotiate within a range so that I don't have to come before the board. Because what happens is, if we interview an applicant, 
Uh, we have a in, in most in most time when people are applying, they're applying to multiple places. They apply to three, <coughs> four, five places. Whoever whoever calls back first, they <laughs> that's where they move, right? Um, but uh, if I want to make a move on a person before I can even talk salary, I have to come before the board. I have to ask, have to ask that person, hey, if you if you if you don't mind, hold on. Let's see if the board approves approves at this salary rate. Uh, if they approve, then we can go forward. If they don't approve, then good luck wherever you go. That's a problem. Uh, that's that's a, time is always of the essence. Um, Sheriff Allen came before the board last meeting and talked about losing deputies because of the, the process of, on, of onboarding taking so long. The same thing happens across the board in most employment situations, mm -hmm. and especially in prosecution situations as well. Um, and so what I'm asking uh, this board is get, just give me negotiating authority to, to negotiate salaries within a range. And what I'm asking is within a $20,000 range from the base. Um, that would be, for example, if the entry level salary for, it's for ASG prosecuted $66,076.41 to negotiate within a range of 66000 to 86000 Now, whether or not an entry level person would actually come in at 86000 probably not. Um, but they might have other experience that I that uh, could fa could uh, facilitate uh, negotiating. For example, a lot of schools have what's called a prosecution clinic, uh, where pro where students get real life prosecution experience, one to two years of experience while they're in school. That would be a person who is entry level, just graduated from school, graduated from law school, but they have ex more experience than a person who had who doesn't have that. Uh, prosecution experience previous, which would allow them to not necessarily come in at 66,000, but more than 66,000. Um, for a person who has uh, um, abundance of experience in, in, in other jurisdictions or just a, a, a niche uh, amount of knowledge on certain things, I need the authority to negotiate salaries with them uh, because we lose quality candidates because of the time delay in trying to come before the board. Um, now, that's, I'm making that request for uh, these hard to fill positions as it relates to prosecutors, but I also want to make the request broadly across all the positions in my office. I'll give you a perfect example. There was a young lady um, who applied with our office for a legal assistant position. Uh, she had current, imp cur current employment in another county, um, was making a certain salary in that county, had been doing the same type of work that we were interviewing for for three, four years. Um, because of how our HR, set, our civil service rules are set up, we can only offer her uh, at a at the entry level, the lowest grade, the lowest step, based on the civil service rules. Where she was working, uh, she was making more. She was interested in changing uh, changing work because of it would be closer to home. Uh, but I couldn't even negotiate with her a salary because her current employment was already more, or was already making more, and so. Uh, if the board be, and we've had this conversation in um, executive session about uh, the authority to negotiate, I'm asking now uh, that it actually be put up to a vote. Are there any so, questions? Yeah, I, yes, I do. Mm. Um, with this ne negotiation and all, would this be within your budget? That's the key. Yes, ma'am. And all? It, it, the, yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the board will, uh, well, I have a budget. Right. The board will... Uh, set the amount that I can negotiate within the range mm -hmm. without having come before the board. The range I'm asking is 20,000, but if the board sees that it should be something less than 20,000 or more than 20,000, then that's to the board's will. But, but the it range. would be within your budget. Yes, ma'am. So let's clarify if I can. So the range, let's just say if it was, okay, yes, you have a range. But if you don't have $20,000 in your budget to play with in that range, it's not that's you can't you don't have it so I believe the question is would you be able to absorb the increase within your approved budget once it's approved because we're getting ready to go through the budgetary mm -hmm. cycle now and we'll be voting I think it's June what day is it Stacy June 20th. the June 20th mm -hmm. so then once we set your budget now if you lose people or whatever and you bring in somebody new that negotiating range has to already be within your budget. You have those funds there. And that's, that's exactly why this is perfect timing, because I'm asking that the budget be set on the high end so that it can, can be absorbed. 
Okay, I think that need a little bit more discussion. So we are all on the same understanding. And so, page. basically, what I'm saying is, um, for if the county, for example, does merit increases, okay, and merit, uh, I think the range of merit increases is from 1.25 percent up to 5 percent. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, I imagine in order for the county to make that, uh, and it's based on salary ranges. I imagine for the county to uh, appropriately budget, they have to budget it on the high end 5%, uh, potentially for all the people who p potentially could make 5% increase. And so what I'm asking for budget sake is that if, if I'm asking for a salary range within 20,000 or whatever the board suggests, that as opposed to the low end of the range that you budget on the high end of the range. Well, is that what? I'm sorry. Even then, so, your scenario reference to the merit increases, we said that mid-level. Uh, 3.75 is where we said that, at, I believe, because not everybody makes it five, not everybody gets the 1.25. But to your point, mm -hmm. you said you have five positions. Vacancies. I have five vacancies and five prosecutors uh, current in all, currently in the office. Right, but you're trying to hire five more. Yes. So in your scenario, we would need to allocate $100,000 uh, to your budget to be able to give you the flexibility to either offer up to 20 or not. Potentially, but not necessarily because of the different salary grades and range based on the position. Yeah, but uh -huh. you said on the high end, the high end would be 100,000, mm -hmm. uh, mid range is 50,000. So don't, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're using those, that, those numbers aren't because uh, ASG entry level versus the ASG two the, the ranges would be different, but yes, 20,000 within a range. I'm just going by what you asking. You said you would like to have 20,000 mm -hmm. per person to negotiate for your open positions. Mm -hmm. You got five. That's $100,000 in addition to that you want added to your budget to be able to give you the latitude to hire or to negotiate. Well, let me ask you this. Um, presently, the, the way that we've been operating is that I come before this board in executive session on each individual um, based on based on their experience okay um, and depending on if the person is very experienced or, or it might be on the high end depending on where this it might be mid mid range if it's entry level I'm not coming before the board um, if we continue in the same fashion that we've been continuing then then whereas I'm at 50% now, um, that number is going to diminish. Uh, and so there's a greater impact to not do it than, to, than it is to do it. And I can somewhat agree that, yeah, I understand what you're saying, and, and there is a need to give you a, a range of latitude mm -hmm. in terms of trying to onboard somebody. But uh, we just, as to Commissioner Franklin's point, need to probably look a little deeper into how we make that happen and what's reasonable. Okay. Sure. So I hear what you're saying, uh, sure. Commissioner Davis. I, to me, it's the process. I understand. We need to turn the latitude over to you. You are the one that runs this department. You, uh, you're the one that's been elected to do that. I, we need to give you everything you need in order to run that department. From the budgetary standpoint, yes, we've got to approve the budget at the higher level because let's just say for some unknown reason, if everything was maxed out, it would cover it in the budget. We know realistically that's not going to take place. It is, I think this goes to also what Commissioner Hamburg has alluded to several times about coming back and circling back around to come to the board for individual and specific employees to get raises. I think that begins to hopefully cut that out to the next budget cycle. If we begin to look at the budget from a future use standpoint and begin to move forward. Um, I think we need to study the process, going back to what Commissioner Franklin is saying. We need to study not just giving you latitude, but the entire process of what we're going to do and how we're going to handle it. I Thank you, Commissioner. I, um, I'll, I'll offer this. I, I think this, this conversation is not a new conversation. Yeah. This is a conversation that's been ongoing for the last two years at least. And so at this point, I'm asking the board to vote on it, yes or no. If you vote no, then obviously there's an impact. If you vote yes, then there's an impact. Um, whether it's negative or positive is completely up to you. I have a question. Uh, Mr. Brooks, so have you included any of this in your budget that you presented already? Yes, ma'am. 
You have presented those numbers. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, those numbers have been augmented, as you know. That's in the budgetary um, that's being presented to us, the budget. I don't understand your questions, Commissioner. So we're getting ready to start looking at the budget. And I, was, I saw an email um, that said that the budget was already balanced. So what I would suggest is you got to get, you need to get with uh, our finance division and find out what's going to be presented to this board before it's presented. Because C Commissioner Hamburg and Commissioner Davis, I'm glad Commissioner Davis said that you were elected because what I printed out are our county powers and our responsibilities. And that doesn't mean that this board goes in and just throws out all money to the is to issues. But what we do have to do is keep in mind that um, we've increased that workload in some areas, but not have offset the equivalence of you or the sheriff or anybody else to make sure that that workload could be contained or dealt with in the appropriate manner. Um, so I think that we definitely need to pay attention to that area as we are going through the budget process. So it would definitely help you out to know exactly what's gonna be presented, what is missing from what you presented during the budget process. And Commissioner Hamburg and Commissioner Davis, where Solicitor General does fall within our guidelines, those constitutional officers, they actually are in control of their offices completely and we should have that same mindset when it comes to what's our role versus their role. I think if everybody does their part, we would do a, have a better understanding of the needs and make sure that we fill those holes in. Uh, that's an excellent point, Commissioner. And, and to that point, uh, the difference between com con constitutional officers and statutory officers, my, my position is a statutory position. That means that by statute it can be eliminated tomorrow, okay? Um, constitutional officers is written within the Constitution and they have com complete authority to enter a contract on behalf of their office um, for the county. They can do that. Um, mm -hmm. But that also means that they also have different pots of money to, to get things from. Right. Um, certain positions have state funds. Certain positions have other funds for supplies. Mm -hmm. Certain positions have other funds for equipment. My only source of revenue as far as funding the office to support the Public safety in this county is, is this board county. commission. That's right. This board commission. So that that's why that's why I'm asking uh, this board to um, give me the authority to do what I've been doing for the last more than a decade. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll uh, circle back around with you. Uh, please get with finance tomorrow, and probably expect a phone call from you. Okay. We'll look after you. All right. Travel policy. Ms. Mayor, quickly. Good evening, Chairman, Vice Chair, and Commissioners. Um, I'm going to piggyback on what um, Solicitor Brooks said for just a second because I know we're feeling it in our department too. Um, we would need a conference with HR on that because if we change those positions in one department, it's going to have effects in other departments as well. So I just want to kind of throw that out there. I know specifically the DA's office would be would be another one that we'd have an issue with. I'm glad you said that, but I think, he, what, let me make sure again, we're on the same page. I thought he asked to clarify sworn versus non-sworn first responders and make them all one or the other and then the other. So we need to make sure we're all on the same page and we're hearing the same thing. I was talking more about the, um, the prosecutors. Grading steps. Oh, the in the grading steps, steps. Gotcha. yeah, because you've got Thank the you. prosecutors in that office and then the prosecutors got it. in the other office. And I think if, be an HR question but I think if we do that for one department we're gonna have to look at it for right. the other we're gonna have some parity issues there so thank you um, for that so a few months ago um, we had the update from Malden and Jenkins regarding the travel audit and I um, came before you and told you after they did their presentation that we would take the recommendations and we would come back to you with a new updated policy um, I emailed that policy to you um, I think a week or two ago so um, my deputy CFO of finance, Kim Booth, is going to come up with some of the recommendations that um, we implemented into this new policy and tell you about the new email and the forms and some of the changes that we've made. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Bring the mic down a little bit. Stop calling Kim, sure. I, I, I said it in a nice, <laughs> like, way, though. Look, I, 
I, I, I can't I got uh, you, girl. dispute that one, I guess. Um, Short people are Okay, right. so essentially um, the need and the purpose as to why we are doing the, the new travel policy and why we, you know, decided we needed one was because Malden and Jenkins, when they audited us, basically said our travel policy was simultaneously too vague in areas as well as too detailed in other areas, too specific. So we wanted to, to come into line and make sure that, that you know, we solved that problem. Um, the new travel policy has been modeled after the state travel policy that is online. Um, we had to make some modifications, but it is, it's very much uh, in line with their policy section by section. Um, the policy is based on the travel industry's best practices um, with a total cost management in mind. So we want to make sure that we're getting the most cost effective travel for the county and, and spending the least amount of money that we possibly can while you know, fulfilling the, the need. Um, the purpose of the new travel policy is to provide the guidelines to the county employees for payment of travel expenses in an efficient, cost-effective manner and to successfully execute their travel requirements at their lowest reasonable cost. So travel reimbursement and requirements. Um, essentially, the travel policy has been developed with the IRS guidelines and regulations in mind when it comes to the primary payment framework so that we stay within the lines of what they require that we do for travel. Um, advances and reimbursements must be reasonable in amount, they must be made for travel only, and they must be in line with the actual costs incurred and must be within policy limitations. Um, travel advances also must be, must, travel advances not substantiated or paid back to the county at the conclusion of the travel or event will have to be deducted from payroll in order for us to stay within the, the framework. Um, travelers should submit all expenses at, for reimbursement and reconciliation within 14 days of the completion of their trip. The traveler or designee must submit the expense claim in munis and attach all receipts as required by the policy. The training document on how to utilize the munis system is available to employees on the buzz, it, it walks them step by step on how to prepare the expense claim and to fill it out. Approvals and authorizations. Um, transactions must be consistent with departmental budgetary and project and grant guidelines. In other words, whatever they, their department is budgeted for, it is re you know, required that they make sure that it's within their budget framework and that whatever the rules for the grants are, are in, you know, they must stay within those guidelines. Department heads are responsible for accessing the need and relativity of travel expenses. They will be the initial one to make the decision, is the travel necessary or, you know, is it, is it not, is it within the guidelines, do we need this travel? A traveler's expense report must be approved through the workflow by all approvers before reimbursement will be issued. We will not issue a check until it has gone through the entire workflow and comes back to us approved by all necessary people. <clears throat> should should um, expenses not meet approval guidelines, the approver should deny the request. If you see something that does not look in compliance then and you are on the approval process it, it is your responsibility to not approve it and not push it forward finance will review the final claim the when it comes to us it comes to us as a verification process and when we, when we verify it we're going to make sure that everything is attached that must be attached that everything is proper that we have everything we need and if the claim is not as it needs to be finance will reject it and not only will we reject it but we will send an email to the traveler as well as their designee if someone has filled out the travel form for them we will make them aware of what needs to be 
changed and what needs to happen in order for it to be approved and be pushed through. Changes and clarifications. So, okay. So finance will book the, one of the main things that we did change, finance will book directly with the hotel vendors for the employees. Um, we will use the, you know, our credit card. We will also secure the reservation um, once a traveler has submitted the hotel accommodation form. Um, the hotel accommodation form is on the buzz, and we will discuss that in another section. Um, if a flight is canceled and an e-credit is returned to the traveler, it is the traveler's responsibility to pay the county back for that, or if they make another reservation at that time, and there is a cost difference that is in the traveler's favor and they have an e-credit left, they will be responsible for paying the county back for that e-credit that they have. All travel expense submissions would need to have the conference agenda, if applicable, if, if it's a conference that they're going to attach as part of the supporting document. The overall specific business purpose of the trip should clearly be displayed on the expense submissions so that everybody knows exactly what the trip is, you know, what, what's, what's the reason for the trip. Okay. So what we have made some changes. So we, we have put the following travel forms uh, onto the buzz um, to make them where they're fillable. You know, used to you had to print them out and fill them out. Now the air travel request form is not only fillable, but it, you can submit it immediately. And we have set up a travel um, email address that is aptravel at you know, claytoncountyga.gov. That goes directly to that travel folder, so they see that Im immediately. And it has all the information that the finance department needs to make that travel, the air, you know, air travel, um, for you. Also, the hotel accommodations is also now a fillable form on the buzz. You can fill it out, hit submit, and it goes straight to that AP travel um, email. We also have a fillable mileage form. Now, you will print it out because it has to be um, attached to the expense claim form, but it, it is fillable now, so it's easy to fill out. You can just print it and We've also added a checklist to kind of help the um, employees going through the process to know what they need to have and have you, have you done this, have you done this, so that you'll have less rejection and uh, it being sent back. We've also um, included a lost receipt affidavit um, that is also fillable that you can print out and have um, notarized and then attach that if you've lost your receipt so that you know you can still be reimbursed. Um, upon, okay, upon, a, upon approval of the new travel policy, finance will offer training classes in person and a video will be made in order to have it out there on the bus so that you can watch the video at any time. Um, and we also will have We'll be going over the new travel policy, the new forms that we've put on the buzz, um, how to properly fill out an expense claim, and all the necessary documents that must be attached. Questions? Did that in record time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. She said questions? short and sweet. I well, so I had a question. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Uh, I always say sorry because I feel like I'm stepping on somebody's toes talking. I heard a voice. <laughs> You look at over here about the receipt. So let me ask you this. Um, one of the things that we do with my job I came from is we have electronic receipts because you know everybody, well, I had to start using Apple Pay. So I use Apple Pay for everything. So is an electronic receipt acceptable or is not acceptable because it keeps track of all of it? Will yeah, it be? Yeah, just need to be converted to a PDF. Right, and then, and. So, you know, it was printed the Uber receipts, Felicia Hunt uber receipts so the way I've, we submitted those those are fine because those are traceable yes is that okay because it's even more specific than a printed receipt because it has the account that I, you know how we paid it yes ma'am i'm that. glad to hear that thank you
I have a question too. Are have, the yes, bank ma'am. receipts like you, you know how you go in your um, in your bank account if you use and you have a receipt for if you pay for a Uber or if you pay okay. for food, can you just snap a picture of that? Um, you're With talking about just like your bank statement. Statement. Mm -hmm. um, no, ma'am, because there's not enough okay. um, detail mm -hmm. on that. Um, okay. And based on the IRS guidelines and what the auditors have said that they need that. to see, no, ma'am, that okay. one would not be acceptable. Commissioner, okay. uh, yes, I have a. A question. Yes, ma'am. Somebody mentioned Uber. Yes, ma'am. Ma and mm -hmm. I used Uber uh, on our last trip, ACCG, mm -hmm. but I was denied uh, refund. Mm. Somebody, somebody explain that to me. You were denied by by it was, finance. It was rejected back to you. Yes. Mm. Um, I would have to check into that because Uber is allowed um, because if, especially if you're going into a city where it's more. Um, yeah. We were in Savannah. Yes, ma'am. And it was denied. Um, I would have to look into your specific claim to see why it was denied because I'll it should have. i to call you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Davis here. Yes. I uh, quickly. I'm just concerned with the time framing. I time frame on a lot of these. It's 30 days. I know. For instance, we have ACCG and NACO conferences that we know further out in advance than that. And sometimes we can get cheaper tickets mm -hmm. um, when we do that as far as, and as well as hotel rates. Can we begin to look at that time frame? Um, my ticket to uh, DC for NACO, we had a cheaper ticket, but because it wasn't within the time frame, the ticket had gone up. So can we begin to look at that so That's why we I can begin to cut ticket. some of those costs? Um, when we do know those. Where it's recommended. Okay. Great. And I'm glad you said that because that's what I ended up doing for Denver because my aide was searching for the rates and so I went ahead and bought the ticket and then submitted it in. So um, I'm glad you stated that. That 30 days is not a good enough window. Mm -hmm. we, li we missed out in Savannah on all the good <laughs> rates, which is why I know all of us was stuck at a hotel so far away and had to Uber even <laughs> though we drove in. And because there was no place to park and all that kind of stuff. So I think we need to definitely um, get those conferences in as soon as they release the date. Well, even Not just for the Board of Commissioners, if somebody else is going to a conference, we need to go ahead and do it. Now let me say this, should nobody be traveling the world? We're not the school system, we can't go to Paris. <laughs> We're not doing that. But yes, ma'am, we can, we can look at those dates. Um, and if we need to make changes to that, we can do that. Thank you. And Good I to see like you, Kim. That this, this is a policy that will be brought back to you for Good. approval. So if you have any specific recommendations that you want us to adjust in the policy, let us know, and then we'll bring that back before the approval. I'm just glad to see y'all come up with a set policy. Mm -hmm. Before now, it was just, what do I want to think up or pull out of the air today? Yep. So thank you so very much. You're very well. Well, uh, yeah, one, one last question, question. right? One yes, ma'am. Question. Uh, you mentioned that this will uh, mimic the state travel. Yes. Okay. Will it do that as far as mileage rates are concerned? Sure. Now you mean as far as like um, when we, you, the state changes from time to time mm -hmm. according to how much they pay per mile. Right. And and we do we we mm -hmm. set ours based on what the IRS guidelines are. We so will you follow what the, what the state does on that? Or we'll follow what the IRS, IRS guidelines are, okay. yes, ma'am. Are required. And just like um, we use the GSA rates for, um, you know, the meal per diems and, and that kind of thing, okay. yes, ma'am. And the IR, real quick, Commissioner, the IRS guidelines are not just for government. They're for everybody. Yes, ma'am. That, that, that is correct. All right. Well, we need to close One up. One other thing that I don't think she mentioned is um, we will be doing a flat per diem. <laughs> and there won't be um, trying to add up for each day. It'll be a flat per diem, um, no matter what the conference. Great. We will go by the GSA, which they, on your travel, they take 75% of, and, and the state as well uses GSA minus the incidentals, because we do not cover incidentals. It's the GSA rate minus incidentals times the 75% will be your first and last days, and then the GSA rate minus incidentals will be all the days in between. Awesome. So it'll be one lump sum amount. Yes, ma'am. So will that be uh, con considered as far as the cities that we travel? Yes, ma'am. So the GSA, if it's a city that has a higher expense, the GSA has that okay. noted as well. Yes, ma'am. Awesome.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, that concludes the uh, <laughs> pre-meeting, and we're going to need to take about a five-minute break, and we will reconvene with the regular uh, business meeting in five minutes. And Mr. Chair, all those that are here for the, um, the, the proclamation, make sure you stay. <laughs>